sorry about that. Da Vinci said, simplicity is the ultimate sophistication. This message has a lot of resonance with what we do in our lab. We like to inculcate a feeling of simplicity in our ideas in every research aspect that we conduct. And I was introduced into this fold of thinking when I first started my doctoral research studying cell migration and its impact on cancer metastasis. Now, here's an interesting thing. I am an electrical engineer. I've always been interested in biology, and I've kept up to date with technology. But when I told my professors, what do you want me to do with this? How can I study cell migration and cancer metastasis as an electrical engineer? They gave me one simple advice. Keep things simple. So as any graduate student would do, I hid the books. I started to remember everything I had studied in biology. And sometimes it felt like all of that was from a previous lifetime. But it came back to me. And I was surprised that in spite of all the advancements that had been made in technology, cancer metastasis had still not been completely understood. Although it had been described as early as the 1800s, very little had been done to understand the mechanisms involved in metastasis and what causes the cancer to become metastatic. There are several challenges to that. However, in late 70s and the early 80s, some effort went into understanding this mechanism. So what is cancer metastasis? In a normal organ, the cells are held together by forces between the cells through the extracellular matrix and also by the basal membrane. Now, when a tumor is formed, these tumor cells gain this ability to break these bonds and go across the basal membrane. At this point, the cell can either enter the circulatory system or the lymphatic system and become metastatic. There's also a very small percentage of cells that can use the inside of the body cavity itself to become metastatic cancer. I also came across some very scary facts. Among all the cancer-related deaths in the world, about more than 90% are attributed to metastatic cancer. That's a staggering number. In 2012, in just US and UK, there were about 730,000. That's 730,000 metastatic-related deaths. So why is this such a huge problem? Is there something we can do about this? As I continued to look and read about it, I had a lucky break. A friend sent me a very interesting article about microfluidics. And I began to think about the metastatic of cancer, met cancer metastasis as a three-step process. In the first, the cells break away. In the second, they enter the circulatory system and they migrate, and this was of interest to me, and invade a secondary organ to form the tumor. And as I mentioned, I was introduced to microfluidics. Microfluidics deals with manipulation of liquids in very small domains. As the name suggests, it's a micro domain. It has been used in diagnostic applications. So I considered the possibility that maybe I could use this to study cell migration. What if I have a very simplified model of two organs being connected by a blood vessel being mimicked by two microfluidic chambers connected by a microchannel? Would that even be possible? My design was to have a channel of height 10 microns, as seen in the cross section, and a width of 25 microns. To give you an idea of the size, the human hair in comparison is about 100 microns in diameter. These devices, these channels, are 10 microns by 25 microns, so they are indeed very small. When I place this device on a standard tissue culture plate on which we grow cells, it would look something like this. Imagine a car driving through a very narrow tunnel. Now replace the walls of that tunnel with the microfluidic device and the surface of the road by the culture plate, and instead of the car, Imagine the cell moving along this tunnel. If I could take microscope images of this, I would be able to study cell migration. Imagine 10 such tunnels. 
I increase my chances of observing the cells in these tunnels. If the device were transparent, with the cells on one side and some chemical factors on the other, I could now look at the cells under a microscope as they were present inside the channels. This led us to develop a microfluidic platform with 32 devices. It just so worked out that a standard tissue culture plate, which is about e-big, is 100 millimeter in diameter, can hold about 32 devices. Thus, from a single device, we moved up to form a platform. This is what the platform looks like. We can now test 32 different conditions, maybe cell lines or different factors on a single platform. We conducted several experiments and took images. A standard image looks something like this. Each microscope image would show 10 channels and portions of the two chambers to give an idea of the location of the cell. By taking images on pre-specified timestamps, for example, every 48 hours, and by comparing them, we can get an idea of two important parameters. One, how many cells have responded to the factor, and two, how far these cells have migrated over that 48-hour period. One of the experiments we conducted as proof of concept was to compare the response of prostate cancer cells to the fetal bovine serum that's added to the culture medium. We looked at the difference in 2%, 5%, and 10%. And it's very obvious that in the case of the 10% fetal bovine serum containing media, the number of cells that not only entered the channel but also moved on to the other chamber was extremely high. Now this is of significance to us because this indicates a certain phenomena that's happening among the cell response. We looked at several experiments, hundreds of them, then we went back and repeated them. This involved different cell lines, different growth factors, chemokines, chemotherapeutic drugs, conditioned media, and all of this, in all of this data, when we looked at cell numbers, when we looked at migration rates, the obvious result or conclusion was that there were certain factors that allowed the cells to migrate faster, and there were even some factors that prevented migration or inhibited migration. All of this is amazing for me as a researcher, as a scientist, and to publish. But what is the practical application to this? How can I use this to help the bigger problem of metastatic cancer? What if there are factors in the blood itself that allow cells to migrate and respond faster? Could that be responsible for metastatic cancer? We looked at that possibility by obtaining samples from non-cancer as well as patients with metastatic cancer. We obtained blood serum from them. In our experiments, we had cells on one side and serum on the other. As you can see in response to the non-cancer trials, there were very few cells that responded and migrated across the channels, whereas in the serum responding to serum from the cancer patient, the response was extremely high. So there was some significance to our data. This research is currently ongoing and we are collecting samples to get statistical significance and to improve upon our experimental processes. To translate that image into data, it looks something like this, looking at cell numbers. The different colors represent the different days that the data was collected. And just to give you an idea of the significant difference that we observed, if I draw your attention to the purple colored bars representing data from day six, it's very obvious that the number of cells in response to the metastatic samples was extremely high compared to the non-cancer samples. Thus, the microfluidic platform can be used as a diagnostic tool. By using very small volumes of the patient's blood, maybe we can predict the, can the possibility of metastatic cancer in the patient. With this prediction, we could also help some of the patients by providing them with smart chemotherapy and ensuring that they don't, they don't have to go through the aggressive treatments that some of the other patients might require. Thus, it lends itself to chemotherapeutic applications also. Now, all of our experiments so far 
did not account for the physiological changes that naturally occur within the body. The cells, as it moves across the blood vessels, sees narrowing of the vessels, widening of the vessels, turning, twisting, and we considered mimicking that in our device by introducing a tapered region in our device that brought down the width of the channel from 25 microns down to five microns. We went ahead and repeated some of our experiments again. In this case, it was prostate cancer cells and non-cancer cells against growth factor. We saw something very, very interesting. In response to the factor, the cancer cells migrated towards the second chamber and then turned around and re-entered the narrow channels. They remained in those five micron wide channels. The normal cells, on the other hand, or the non-cancerous cells, continued on into the second chamber and proliferated there. Now, this is of significant value. This shows that there is a difference between the responses of cancer cells and non-cancerous cells. We recently published this data and continue to look into this in detail. Among all of this, we forgot the most powerful tool we had was that we can now image the cancer cells migrating in real time. This video shows prostate cancer cells over a 48-hour period migrating in response to a growth factor. As you can see, some of the cells move very fast, some move very slow, some are dividing in the channel, some move into the chamber, some re-enter, and all of this phenomena is happening in one single device, and we were able to capture this using time-lapse imaging. Over a 48-hour period, images were taken every minute. Now, this allows us to analyze each of these cells case by case and understand the phenomena behind cell migration. Going back to our research philosophy, I now appreciate and thank my mentors for having given me this idea to work with things that are simple. Because I realize that simple things have certain inherent advantages. They are reliable, they are robust, they're easy to implement. In this case, the devices were easy to fabricate, they were easy to place on the culture plate and thereby eliminating the need to figure out how to grow cells in a new environment. We were following standard tissue culture protocols in this case. They're easy to interface. These devices can be used um, in many platforms in many ways, and the data that you obtain from this have a clarity. They're easy to interpret. With all of these advantages, it becomes easy to communicate with a larger audience. I can explain this data to everybody in simple terms. This opens up opportunities for synergy among various fields between students, engineers, researchers, doctors, scientists, the whole community even. I believe it is this simple approach that we have towards our research that has allowed us to include a number of students in all of our work. We have high school students as well as undergraduate students doing their own projects. Some of them have co-authored conference as well as journal papers. In fact, one of our students is out there presenting his data at a science fair today. I feel privileged that I get to work with these brilliant minds that will shape our future. I'm thankful to my mentors, Dr. J.C. Chiao and Dr. Victor Lin, who took it upon themselves to turn an electrical engineer into an acceptable biologist. I'm really grateful that they supported my ideas, no matter how crazy they seemed at times. And before I wrap up, I want to leave you with my email address and invite you to contact me if you have any questions. Please don't hesitate. Thank you.